All right, good afternoon, folks, and welcome to a... Okay, folks, apologies for the uh, connection issues, despite being connected to the Wi-Fi here at the Nature Center. It looks like we are having... <laughs> as you may be able to gather from the fog and the sounds of the rain falling from the trees. It is a wet, wet day here in Highlands. We had a big monsoon rain this morning and they're calling for more rain at any moment. So we're actually gonna step back inside the nature center in just a moment um, where hopefully the cell signal and the Wi-Fi strength will be strong enough to keep this as a live broadcast. Welcome to everybody who's joining us. We're just about to head inside and get going. Hope you guys are looking forward to today's topic, the buzz about bees. Here we go. And if you wanna keep your fingers crossed for that cell signal to stay strong, <laughs> that'd be awesome. You can see some of my props that we're gonna be using a little bit later in the program. All right. Howdy folks! I hope you all are doing well and that you were excited for our March 2021 Nature 101 program, The Buzz About Bees. As you may notice, this format looks a little bit different than our normal Nature 101s. Um, it's supposed to rain at any point in time out there, so for our staff and for our equipment and for some of the props that I've got for you guys, I figured it might be safest if we stayed inside the Nature Center for the first time. Uh, considering that we live in a temperate rainforest, I'm honestly surprised and gratified that it's taken almost a year of virtual programming for us to have to be inside for one of these. So I'm gonna make this really interactive. I don't want this to be a talking head program. So I'm gonna start off by saying hello again. If you wanna say hello in the chat, let us know where you're watching from, please do. Um, I, my name, for those of you who may not know me, is Paige Engelbrexen, and I am the Nature Center Education Specialist for the Highlands Biological Foundation. If you are not familiar with the foundation, we support natural history research and education in the Southern Appalachians, primarily here at the Highlands Biological Station through programs like this one. Our Nature 101 series is a monthly, <laughs> hello Kenny from Utah, it's good to see you here, I'm glad you could join us again. Um, our Nature 101 series is a monthly exploration in the off-season of a general natural history topic or question. And I was really um, pleased when I knew one of our, our frequent listeners, hello Angela, asked about what is a native bee because we already had this program on the calendar. So hello Laura, welcome from Georgia. I bet you guys are probably getting the same rain that we are here. <laughs> um, and that's the question I want to ask to you as I get ready for the first part of our program. What do you all think of when you think of a bee and then you think of native bees? Are there any images or, or words or ideas that come to mind for you guys? I'm always curious about what you guys think, especially compared to what I pick up while preparing for these programs. When I say the word bee, I think for most people, they think of this guy. Oh, I just realized it's backwards for you all. It won't be in a short moment. Um, honey and pollen is what Kenny says he thinks of, and oftentimes that's in connection with this. This is the honey bee, which produces what we consume as honey. Um, and so I don't blame you for thinking of bees first and foremost because they are everywhere. The Cheerios logo is even a honeybee, Honey Nut Cheerios. And in our everyday language, you may he hear people called queen bees. It comes from honeybee hives where they have a queen bee. Are honeybees native to North America? If we were to be here in North Carolina thousands of years ago, would we find honeybees? Hello, thank you guys for joining. Are honeybees native to North America? 
This is, ah, hello, Sonia. Welcome, you will recognize some of this content. Sonia Carpenter is the project specialist for the Highlands Biological Foundation, um, and she helped me frame this program. So I hope I do you proud. Sonia is saying, if we were here in North Carolina, specifically here in Highlands, for example, thousands of years ago, we would not find honeybees, but we would still find bees. Sonia is pointing out we would find bees called solitary bees and ground, or perhaps ground nesting bees who are solitary. And she's right. We would find bees who literally do nest in the ground. Not at all what we think of when we think of honeybees. Honeybees nest in hives, man-made hives, or tree trunks, um, if they've escaped from beekeepers. So what's up with the bees that nest in the ground? Or the bees that nest in wood? These are what we're referring to when we say native bees. Honeybees came from Europe. We brought them here. But there are more than 500 species of native bees here in North Carolina and more than 4,000 across the entire country. So there are many more bees than just honeybees. And we're gonna get to know them a little bit better today. The first thing that I wanna do, and we'll see how this works out, is I wanna play a guessing game. Um, for a live stream, if you guys wanna take a crack at the answers, as I tell my kids, do not be afraid to be wrong. Science is all about being wrong because that's how we learn. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch views here in just a moment and I'm going to put a card down on the table in front of my camera. And I'd like you guys to guess if what you see is a bee or another kind of insect. And if you have an idea about what kind of insect it is, please feel free to share and we'll see what we know because I'm willing to bet you guys know more than you think you do. So the first bee or not a bee, if you're, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> bee or not a bee um, is this bee right here. Oh, is this insect right here. Any guesses about what this is? Yes, okay, Kenny has picked up on the Shakespeare reference that I keep laughing about. <laughs> to be or not to be. Um, Kenny is guessing that this is a wasp. I'll tell you when I look at this photo, I'm noticing how very hairy this particular insect seems to be. A big fat butt, lots of hair. And Laura is suggesting perhaps this is a bumblebee. Very similar. One of the big fat bees flying around. This is a carpenter bee, specifically an eastern carpenter bee. So really hairy, a native bee. See, I bet you were familiar with carpenter bees. So you are familiar with our native bees. Okay, our next one, what about this guy? I am personally very familiar with this insect for better or for worse. If you happen to be doing a lot of trail work or hiking off, um, you will probably be familiar with this one as well. So Laura is commenting that uh, the carpenter bees eat your deck and that is entirely possible. Although I feel bad for the carpenter bees because they think it's just the perfect nesting place and they don't know that you need your deck. So Kenny is saying this is, <laughs> this has to be a yellow jacket and Kenny, you are correct. These are Eastern yellow jackets, and I have had many an encounter with them. Yep, you got it, Patricia. Um, <laughs> when you find one day yellow jacket, you're probably gonna find a lot more in short order if you find them in the fall. So I've got honeybees, carpenter bee, a yellow jacket. Here's one I bet you're probably not as familiar with. Is it a bee or something else? When I'm looking at this picture, I'm noticing my yellow jacket has some hairs too. 
So there's some fuzzy hairs here. Hmm. So Laura is suggesting this may be a wasp. And Sonia is asking if this might be a sweat bee. Uh, if you're familiar with the sweat bee, raise your digital hand because I bet you you've seen them even if you don't know them. This is another group of small, relatively small bees. In particular, this is a mining bee. And if you want to take a guess about why they're called that, we have some bees who nest underground. Perhaps they were said to be mining. So this is actually another bee called a mining bee. All right, let's try this one. A bee or not a bee? Yes, Patricia, you've got it. They get their name from the fact that they like loose sandy soils that they excavate as tunnels to lay their eggs in. And I'm hearing the rain pick up on the roof, which means staying inside was probably a good idea. <laughs> All right, Patricia is stating that this is a wasp. Um, looking at this, I'm not noticing a lot of hairs. It looks pretty smooth and shiny. Itty bitty little waist, these long wings. Kenny is also suggesting it's a wasp. This is a northern paper wasp. Good identification, guys. So we, so far we've seen the yellow jackets and paper wasps, which are both wasps and three species of native bees. So what about this guy? I think he's another wasp. I hope I've cleverly disguised my bees and non-bees by showing them all being on flowers. <laughs> when I'm looking at this picture, I'm noticing a lot of little hairs. He looks fuzzy again. Some hairs here. Ah, oh, Winter is suggesting a fly. Very good idea. This actually has probably the prettiest name of any bee that I'm familiar with. This is a pure golden green sweat bee. So I think winter is suggesting flies because flies are known to be bee mimics, bee lookalikes, but this guy's actually a sweat bee. All right, now we get to the challenge round. Bee or not a bee? Yes. Sonia said that is a sweat bee and she is entirely correct. So uh, miss, while we think about what this one is, um, sweat bees do drink nectar and eat pollen, but they are also attracted to our sweat, which is how they get their name. I often have them land on my hands in the summer. Oh. <laughs> yes, they are cute. All right, this guy is not a bee. Kenny is right. This is a bald-faced hornet. Sonia, congratulations for getting that. You can see some hairs here, um, that itty bitty little what I found termed a wasp waist. Yeah, bald-faced hornet. This is one that I've become familiar with uh, hanging around my porch. They like to build their nests around my house and I would like them to build their nests anywhere else in the national forest besides my house. And our very last contestant, hopefully this is a quick gimme. Look how fuzzy it is. Somebody guessed this one earlier in the program. Patricia is commenting, she missed her wasp ways. <laughs> All right, so we have many, many suggestions coming in that this is a bumblebee. And yes, this is our common Eastern bumblebee. Fun fact, I learned while researching for this program, bumblebee, when you're referring to a species, seems to be two words instead of one. Yeah, our big, fat, fl fuzzy, flying bumblebee. So... 
I'm going to gather these together for a moment. And you may notice there's been a pattern. We either have our bees or we have a separate group that has been generally referred to as wasps. Any guesses about why I've particularly selected wasps as bee lookalikes? Winter correctly noted that flies can also look like bee mimics. So we could have had a flies in here and really gotten everybody <laughs> turned around on their insect identification. Bumbles have the cutest butt, Patricia is saying, and I would agree. There's just little big fat drones flying through the summer air. got bees, I've got wasps, and structurally they seem to be pretty different. Generally fuzzy, generally skinny waist and sh with fewer hairs, long narrow wings, usually broader wings, all general rules of thumb of course because nature likes to do nothing so much like break rules that it makes. When I was looking up this program Wasps are predatory. They eat animal protein. Bees eat protein as well. It just happens to come from plants in the form of pollen. Bees are actually wasp relatives. They've wasp, they are wasps that have gone vegetarian, <laughs> which um, we're going to switch back for just a hot moment here. When I read that. It was one of those things that I realized I'd never actually thought about where bees had descended from in the animal tree. So wasps were going around and, and catching or scavenging their, their protein. And then somewhere along the lines, uh, a little over 100 million years ago, when flowers really became a big thing, some wasps began to adapt to eating pollen from flowers because pollen is very rich in protein. Pollen doesn't run away. Pollen doesn't fight back. <laughs> Pollen is probably gonna be there as long as your flowers are there. So bees are vegetarian wasps, right? Kenny is, is saying that's brilliant and I just think it's an amazing sample of how adaptive nature is and how flexible it is. So we've got vegetarian wasps. And in addition to sharing a lineage, bees and wasps share something else as well. And I'd like for you to moment, for a moment to feel the warmth of the summer sun and the cool breeze through the trees and perhaps some dog hobble and, and oak leaf hydrangea with lots of insects buzzing around. And you're out with friends and one of them looks at you and goes, ooh, you've got a wasp by your head. Or, ooh, you've got a bee by your head. What's your reaction going to be? You hear, oh, you've got a wasp by your head. It's pretty instinctive. Patricia is commenting that is the coolest way to look at it. Nature's amazing. Um, I'm going to put this back up here so I'm not completely washed out by our lights. So if somebody says, oh, you've got something by your head. Yep, Patricia is saying she goes to SWAT. And I cannot tell you the number of people who I've seen do this, and I cannot tell you how many times I've done it, which is, whoop, gotta get away from it, gotta go, gotta swat it away. And I get that. One of the clearest memories that I have of my early childhood is getting stung in my mouth by a bee that fell into the Kool-Aid I was drinking at the time. And as I mentioned, yellow jackets and I have a very special relationship uh, after years of trail building. But, our most bees, and remember, I'm not thinking honeybees, I am thinking native bees, those hundreds of species we have here in North Carolina. Will most bees sting you? What do you guys think? It's raining even harder now. Temperate rainforest, y'all. We've gotten at least 13 inches of rain so far this year. So we are well on track to stay above our 80 inches of rain a year. So Patricia is, is hypothesizing that no, most bees that we have here in North Carolina will not sting you. Sonia has gotten onto the start of it. 
So bees have males and females. No male bee, generally speaking, has a stinger. Only the females have stingers. So half the bees we have here in North Carolina can't sting you to begin with because they don't physically have the stinger. But what about those remaining females? Those hundreds of bee species that we have. Why will most of the females who have stingers not sting? I mean, if you've had close encounters with paper wasps or yellow jackets or bald-faced hornets or angry honeybees, you know they can and will sting. So why is it that most of the bees we see or hear or don't even notice here on the plateau won't sting you? I'm gonna switch back to the front view and do some quick rearranging. <laughs> all right, I advise you all to pay attention to what Sonia is saying as I rearrange these very quickly. Ah, okay, so Patricia is pointing out that stinging will kill the female. Yes, that is true. Um, as far as I'm aware for bees, wasps, I have a suspicion might be slightly different. I know I've been stung multiple times by female wasps before, individual female wasps. There was one of them, she wasn't happy with me, I wasn't happy with her. These things happen. But the females that we think of when we think of yellow jackets and honeybees and hornets and paper wasps and, and even occasionally bumblebees. These are the ones that are going to be most likely to sting you. Our carpenter bees, our mining bees, our sweat bees, and many, many more bees won't. Sonia is saying that most female bees, most, females, most species of bees are not protecting anything. What are these guys protecting? Just looking at who I've got here, I've got yellow jackets and hornets and paper wasps and honeybees, and this one might be a little bit difficult, even bumblebees. If they're the ones that are gonna sting you, what are they protecting? Get some of my props ready. Ah, okay, Kenny is suggesting that these particular species are going to be protecting nests and hives. This is where I'm gonna switch back. Ta-da! This is a paper wasp nest. I can't turn it all the way upright or it's going to fall apart. Um, but these are those massive paper-like nests that you see hanging off of tree branches. You can see there's a lot of paper forming a protective outer shell. And what do you see in the middle here? What's inside of this nest? What's going to come out of each of these little cubicles, for the lack of a better word? If you're thinking babies, the answer is yes. So, whoop. Let me keep going back this way. Brilliant. The species that we think of, yeah, Lar Patricia's got it. She's saying larva. Larva are going to come out of here. And this is not nearly as exciting a visual. This is a bit of honeycomb where we could have actual honey, which is what was in here, um, given to me by a friend. Or elsewhere in the bee honey bee hive, we can have larva. Think about it. You've got... These species have large nests and hives that are fixed in a stationary place with many, well, hopefully many larvae and stores of food to protect. If you've ever tried to knock down a hornet's nest or you've walked over a yellow jacket nest, they come out to protect it because there are two things, well, three things really worth protecting. The queen, the reproductive female, the only one who's gonna have more kids, the kids, and then the food for the kids in the next generation. These are what we call social species because they all have queen bees 
or queen individuals for the most part, and they are all working collectively together to support and raise and protect the next generation of, in, of bees or wasps that this queen is going to have. So if you're in a beehive with thousands of worker bees and one queen, does it matter if thousands of workers die to protect this large stationary protein rich food source that bears or skunks might be very interested in eating? Or meddlesome people hacking Maddox into the ground to build trail? <laughs> Oops. I'm speaking from personal experience for that one. I bet a few of you here have also done something similar. We've been digging out in the garden and accidentally disturbed a yellow jacket nest. You are a threat and they need to ensure that next generation moves forward. So it's worth it for them to die to protect the young. What about though, I'm gonna switch back here. What about these guys? And this is a very disproportionate sample size. These guys are mostly the exception. The rule is much more what these three find. Yes, Patricia is pointing out, it doesn't matter if the workers die, they're willing to sacrifice themselves. And that does tie in with the stinging killing them. These guys tie into what something that Sonia mentioned near the beginning of the program when we were envisioning what bees we might find here in Highlands thousands of years ago. She used the phrase solitary. So, if we have a carpenter bee, for example, she is her own queen. She's not going to have anybody else helping her out. It is her job to find an appropriate nesting site, which, I'm sorry, Laura, that sounds, to, sounds like your deck, and to excavate a nesting site, and then to lay an egg, give it a big piece of what they call pollen bread, food for the larva when it hatches, and to seal it off and lay an egg and put in pollen bread and seal it off and lay an egg. She is responsible for passing on her own genes and ensuring her next generation. And once she's done this, she's going to leave. She does not tend to her young. They are going to, they are going to grow inside of these chambers, eating that pollen bread until they're ready to emerge as adults. Um, the same thing is true for these mining bees, the ones that are building nests underground. They'll excavate tunnels, lay an egg, put in some pollen, and leave. So this female doesn't care if you come over and bother this site. She's never going to know. She needs to keep moving forward, metaphorically speaking, continuing to make more eggs because if she dies, that's it. Um, this is a really fantastic book. It's available online as a PDF. Uh, I'm gonna drop a link to it in the comments if I remember. Somebody please remind me at the very end of this. <laughs> um, that really highlights the wide diversity of bees that we have. So most of our bees are what we call solitary bees because they don't have any help raising their young and they don't really raise their young at all. They find a good nest site, they lay them the eggs, they give them some food provisions, and then they leave. So if they were to sting you and die, their genes aren't going to go forward. So it's really not worth stinging you at all. Um, what I try to tell the kids is when something starts flying around their head, to stay very still and just say, hi friend, and wait for the bee to move on, because odds are it's not gonna be really interested in you anyway. If you swat, that's an aggressive action. It might sting you out of self-defense, but most of the flying insects, most of the bees we have around here are not aggressive because as Sonia pointed out, they don't have anything to defend. Any questions so far? I'm sorry, I forgot to say, if you have any questions, make sure to drop them in the chat. I really don't want this to just be me talking for the last part of the program. Sorry, flipping to my next pages. 
if you have any questions, please do drop them. I suspect there's a little bit of lag from when you guys put in comments to when I see them. So I apologize if it seems like I'm moving on even though you've commented. But my, my question to you all is why should we care about native bees? Should we really care at all? Is it important? Um, are they important? I'm going to up a little bit so that we don't get back there. Uh, Patricia is asking how we help native bees through the winter. Very good question. I am going to touch on this. We're going to do, well, it's still raining. <laughs> if it stops raining, we'll do a short tour of the outdoor garden if the signal per permits. But we will touch on how we help. Okay. Patricia is saying we should care about bees because no bees means no food. Um, there are some really uh, startling gut reactions that you can get to images that I've seen around the internet um, where they show a produce section and they say, this is what we have in our produce store right now. This is what it looks like without bees. And I've, the figure that normally gets thrown around is about one in every three bites of food we eat depends on bees for pollination. If you eat blueberries, if you eat tomatoes, if you eat um, squashes and watermelons and cucumber, those are around because of our native bees. So without our native bees, we don't have those. And I've got to tell you, I'm very fond of cucumbers and watermelons. I would like for there to be more. Um, there's also just the general intrinsic value of the biodiversity of hundreds of bee species and what we may find out about them down the line and how they participate in our ecosystems. But if you really care about food, you care about squash bees. These guys actually get up in the morning when the squash flowers are first starting to open and pollinate them as opposed to honeybees which show up later in the day. And if you're like me and you have a bunch of blueberry bushes, we have a southern, southeastern blueberry bee that is responsible for, make, for pollinating blueberry bushes more efficiently and more effectively than um, honeybees and other bees that we have. And even azaleas, I'm serious, I love this book. Uh, even azaleas have special relationship with some bees. The reason why there are crops like tomatoes and blueberries that honeybees can't pollinate is because the flowers store, pretend this is a salt shaker, I didn't grab one this morning. The flowers store their pollen and a honeybee flies in and can't actually access the pollen. So won't pollinate the flowers as it's going from one to the other. But many of our native bees are able to get in the flower and then they start shaking their flight muscles and they're shaking the pollen out like salt out of a sh salt shaker. So it gets all over them. And then when they go to the next flower, they're carrying that pollen and able, and so they're able to successfully pollinate, which is, I mean, it's just really cool. So if you like food, if you like biodiversity, if you like ecosystems functioning, we should care about our native bees. Sonia is asking why some flies look like bees. Okay. If you are waltzing around in the botanical garden and you see something that is black and yellow, are you going to mess with it? What colors does this, what do these colors make you think right away? Or the sound of something flying by or buzzing around your head. Um, while you guys think about that, Patricia is saying there's a blueberry bee that makes her so happy, and I agree. I mean, it's just, nature is really awesome. Um, I didn't realize we had native leaf cutter bees here in the United States until I was reading this book. It's fantastic. Um, and blueberry, southeastern blueberry bees are only active and out when the blueberry bushes are blooming. I would assume the rest of the time, the eggs or larva or adults are dormant, waiting for the next spring to come around. So they are, they are tied very closely with those blueberry bushes because they have evolved a, a symbiotic beneficial relationship, a tight link. 
All right, back to what do you think if you see something, we don't even see its face. We just see that yellow and black and zoom. Kenny says caution. It makes him think caution. And that is the most often suggested answer for why one creature mimics a dangerous creature. If you are a harmless little fly and you can't sting to save your life because you don't have a stinger, but you look like something that has a stinger, something you are less vulnerable because you seem more dangerous. That didn't phrase really well. Um, if you look like something dangerous, most creatures will just assume that you are because it's not worth taking the risk to figure out if you are or not. Um, we see this with monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies are poisonous because they feed on milkweed. And there are other butterflies, and I don't have an insect guide with me, that are not poisonous, but they have that same orange and black coloration to mimic the poisonous butterflies which theoretically helps them avoid being eaten. I hope that answers your question. And if you guys have heard other suggestions for why one species mimics another, um, or know specifically of examples, please drop them in the chat. I am always learning from you all. Um, and heaven knows I don't always get everything right. So Native bees are amazing and we should care about them. And now we get to the question that Patricia asked, which is how can we help them? She, you asked specifically about the winter, Patricia, um, but a lot of these, the ways that we can help bees are going to help them through the winter. So if we look away from the headlines about colony collapse disorder and fungal mites and neonicotinoids killing off honeybees, and we think about the plight of the native bees, which are in decline like many other species around the world. What do you guys think or know that we can do to help them? Okay, Sonia is, yes, this is the term, and I'm not gonna say it right. There's a reason that I stopped taking Latin. Um, Mullerian, 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 Mullerian mimicry. Sound confident, nobody will know you're wrong, right? <laughs> and she, Sonia is commenting that it, that is super cool. Um, yeah, I think it's amazing. We have black rat snakes here at the Nature Center, and I, I have never seen or heard of this before, but um, I was removing them from their cages one day, and I had put in dried dead leaves, because it was fall, and I was like, okay, we're gonna give them some enrichment. I'm gonna put dead leaves in here. And I'm getting ready to take the black rat snake out and all of a sudden I hear this rattling noise. I'm standing there going, okay, that doesn't make any sense. We definitely don't have rattlesnakes here in the nature center. And I realized the black rat snake was irritated with me. So he was shaking his tail very rapidly in the dried leaves. And I st I've started watching since then and I noticed that when they get touchy and they don't wanna do whatever I'm asking them to do, they'll be wiggling their tails, vibrating them. And if they happen to be in dried leaves, it sounds like a timber snake's rattle. So if you're just walking through the woods and hear rattle, 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 you're not gonna stop to figure out if it's a black rat snake or a rattlesnake. You're gonna say, peace, I'm going the other direction. So the black rat snake benefits not from visually mimicking a poison, a venomous species, but by um, imitating a behavior, a physical feature. So I, that's probably, uh, if not malarian mimicry, something that can do it. That was a tangent. Um, if we are looking to help native bee species, there are a couple of things we can do. And I will give you guys a hint. There is a beautiful intersection between laziness and being eco-friendly. And I have found it. And I am exploiting it for all it is worth. <laughs> um, because oftentimes when we maintain things to uh, cultural standards, we are interfering in the normal cycle of nature. Lawns. Are lawns with just grass natural? 
Ah, Patricia has found one perfect example. No raking. Don't rake. Leave the leaves. Um, aha. So our bumblebees are one of the few social species we have. They have a queen bee who has to survive from one fall to the next spring. And when she survives in the spring, she'll excavate a little nest. She'll lay a teeny tiny cluster of eggs, start gathering honey and making what's called a little honey pot and then raising her next generation. But she has to survive the winter. And if you're an insect, that's, that's hard. It can be. She, queen bumblebees survive by digging into the ground, usually not very far, but under leaves because leaves are a fantastic insulator. The earth is probably not going to freeze, especially around here. <laughs> Patricia's saying death to leaf flowers <laughs> for many reasons, but yes. Um, leaves are going to trap any heat that the earth is producing and slow the chill from the air when things do start to get really cold. So if we leave the leaves, we are creating more spaces for queen bumblebees to overwinter and come out the next spring to survive and raise the next uh, generation of bumblebees. So yes, be lazy, don't rake your leaves. Um, also on the subject of laziness and eco-friendliness, lawns are unnatural things, the way that we have them. I haven't touched a lawnmower in two years now, and I really well and truly don't intend to ever again. I don't have a, a sizable lawn, but I've watched it go wild now for two summers, and I get knee-high red clover. I get plantain, you know, eight inches tall. I, I get dandelions that go over my hiking boots. And I have a lot of insects in what used to be my front yard because I'm letting their not necessarily native habitat, things like dandelions and plantain aren't native for the most part here in North America, but I'm providing beneficial habitat. I'm giving them food in the form of flowers and I'm giving them shelter in the form of tall grasses and leaf stem and dead leaves. Um, and I'm not, close cropping all of it to produce a grass that looks good, I guess, if you're into that kind of thing. So be lazy. Let your lawn turn into a pollinator paradise or a section of it even. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of, of ways to be bee friendly. And I wanna give a huge shout out to Bee City USA. This is an organization that promotes bee friendly practices that individual cities and towns can sign up for. We are one here in Highlands. Being a bee city is about planting pollinator gardens, providing more food, and also reducing pesticide use because most of our bees are ground nesters, like our mining bees. So if we spray a lot of pesticides on the ground or herbicides, you could have a serious impact on these guys. Um, pesticides on flowers are also a huge issue. So don't use pesticides. Let the dandelions take over your lawn. Just because they're weeds doesn't mean they're bad. If you guys have any other ideas or questions, please drop them in the chat because I want to give you guys a quick rundown of um, some plants that I've heard referred to as weeds before, and then we'll wrap up. So if you have any things that you want me to address live on air, please do. Um, but if you're like me, yarrow grows in my lawn as well. Um, and that's one of, uh, that's a good bee friendly plant. Uh, Kenny is saying pollinator paradise sounds like a rock song. I think, you know, that sounds, I, if anybody wants to write it, I'm happy to give them the rights to that name. That'd be awesome. Um, those of you with allergies may be very unhappy about goldenrods blooming, but when I had goldenrods blooming in one of my front gardens, they're just, I mean, you can't turn around 
for it being overwhelmed by the hum of the bees. Um, there's even itty bitty little plants like the crane bills, which are related to geraniums. Um, these little guys, kind of scraggly ones, great bee food. Many thanks to Highlands Bee City, which is housed under the Highlands Plateau Greenway for creating some of the, the lists that I pulled a lot of these from. Uh, and even thistle, which we may not like, is also a good bee food. Let your lawns go wild and grow whatever. You're helping the pollinators. It's for a good cause. I think the only other thing I wanted to touch on, right, it's the biggest thing here, and of course I'm completely missing it. You've probably seen these around the botanical garden in very different shapes and sizes. Um, these are what we call bee houses. So a lot of our bees, 80%, of our native bees nest in the ground, like our, our mining bees, but 15 or so percent nest in stems. So if we imagine purple coneflower grows and then it dies and its stem stays there, I'm gonna have trouble getting that to focus on me. Um, the stem stays there over the winter and through the spring until new growth from the coneflower pushes it up or people trim it. That stem is a fantastic nesting site. A female bee can um, chew into the side, climb down, uh, cap it, lay an egg, put in some pollen, cap it, lay an egg, put in some pollen, cap it, lay an egg, put in some pollen. Um, that's called stem nesting. And that, when we clean our gardens in the fall or early spring and take all of the supposedly dead, useless stuff out, we take away chances for bees to nest in them. So you can build bee houses where you replicate the hollows, like in wood for carpenter bees, or in these stems for our stem bees, and then hang these outside um, facing southwest, and then change these out every year or so after the eggs inside of hatch can come out. Or leave your garden really messy with lots of stems around. Like I said, being lazy, it's being eco-friendly too. And there are a ton of resources out there. Um, I mean, a lot of resources out there. So you can get more involved with Bee City, the Xerces Society, more pollinator conservation organizations than I can rightfully think of right now, but there are many. Um, so if you're interested in helping our hundreds of native bees, those are some ideas. All right, last call for questions. Sorry, this has been a lot of me talking and not walking, but it's still, <laughs> it's still raining. Um, uh, well, anybody who says, ah, winter has got it. Thank you so much, winter. Yes, and Sonia is noting that the bee houses need to be cleaned out or replaced annually to prevent bee disease or predate, and predation. Um, so this, if this hangs out year after year after year, um, not only is it the material probably going to go bad, but you can, it can serve as a reservoir, as she's pointing out, for disease year after year. So a little bit of effort, but not a lot. And Patricia says she's been de-stemming in the fall, lesson learned. Katrina, I have that link pulled up on my computer and we'll certainly be dropping it um, in a moment. I know, I know Winter linked to a bee box activity, which correct me if I'm wrong, Winter, but I think that would be um, making one of these bee houses. So we'll get you the bee basics PDF at the end of the program. And yes, um, Sonia was actually the one who was telling me about leaving the stems up, leaving a messy part of your garden, if not all of your garden. Because you got to think, we've got queen bees that overwinter and they get out or they are staying as larvae in these stems over winter. Um, so if you clean those stems, you're taking away important nesting sites. And it just means waiting a little bit longer 
So laziness, eco-friendliness, it's wonderful. Sorry for not mowing my lawn, mom. <laughs> um, if you have any other questions, but while you guys think of any, I do wanna say thank you. We are coming up on a year of virtual programming, which feels strange to say. Um, certainly not something that I ever anticipated doing so much in my career, but it has been a delight and a joy every week, every month, or every few weeks to jump on and get a chance to talk with you all. I hope these have been helpful and engaging and at the very least entertaining. Sometimes all I ask of a program is that it makes somebody laugh. If you don't, you don't have to learn anything. I'm sure many of you know more about these subjects than I do. Um, but thank you for your support and for being here and participating. Just like Patricia was saying, she can do lazy. I can too, it's amazing. <laughs> uh -huh. We are going to be having our next garden tour the first Monday in April. Um, I want to say that's, I'm not gonna say a date because I'm gonna get it wrong. First Monday in April at 11.30 and we'll see if it's a recording or a live stream. Um, I hope you guys are looking forward to it. If you want to keep up on our programs, you can sign up for our e-blast at highlandsbiological.org where you'll get updates about things like our summer camps, which are already full, but you can get on our wait list for them, um, or upcoming programs or other cool things we've been doing. So we try and do a lot of cool things around here. Thank you very much, Patricia and Candy and Kenny and Katrina, it is, it's great to see and connect with you guys um, and get the chance to, to geek out over all of this. You'd be amazed at how nerdy I get <laughs> researching all of this. So it's wonderful to get the chance to share it to you all. All right, folks, I think that's probably my cue to hop off. Hi, Charlotte, so glad you're enjoying. <laughs> Um, I have, hope you guys have a dry Tuesday, or at least stay dry if you're having the kind of rain that we are. Winter is coming in to save the day. It is Monday, April 5th at 11.30 a.m. I can't keep a calendar in my head, which is why Google Calendar rules my life. Um, I hope you guys are looking forward to it. I'm very excited to show you guys what's been coming up in the garden. I saw the first unopened trout lily yesterday and about lost my mind. I think some visitors in the garden heard me talking to the flowers and were a little concerned. It's spring. We can get excited about these things. So please tune in then. It should be a good time and I look forward to seeing you all on the next program. Take care and be well. Bye.